Every once in a while, there are moments in history that reshape the world we live in. 2020 is one of those moments when our world comes to a standstill. But ever wonder what happens after a global pandemic? Mm. First thing I want to do when the pandemic is over is open mouth kiss everybody. <laughs> I mean, open mouth kiss every consenting adult. Just want to make sure that's clear. The post-pandemic world, people are just so full of the... Ah! Like, you know, from being cooped up for like a year and a half, and we're just gonna want to let that out. Bet your bottom dollar people are gonna go nuts. So definitely a lot of babies out of wedlock. <laughs> These guys that have been out of the game for a while are a little bit itchy, I'll tell you that. A lot of booze, a lot of parties, and a lot of orgies. So, mask off orgies. Will the post-pandemic future be full of wild debauchery? Sometimes a clue to the future can be found in the past. The 1920s are an amazing moment uh, in terms of world history, I would say culturally as much as anything else. The high, wide and handsome 1920s brought undreamed of prosperity. It's exciting, it's exuberant, it's youthful. For some people, it was a big party. People have a sense of abandon and freedom. They feel that now they can try anything and do anything. There was this really strong pull towards the new and the modern and the fashionable. It really is a time of incredible prosperity. For the Wall Street guys, it's unprecedented in terms of the wealth, in terms of what's happening in this country. The pace of change is so incredibly fast. People felt that they were living in the future. This is the history of the Roaring Twenties in 501 Kisses, 1,000 Drag Queens, and two and a quarter billion beers. number best sums up a moment in time? In the middle of the 1920s, George Taylor discovers it's the number 15. George is a young college economist. Hmm. When he's not studying his spreadsheets, he likes to play pool and chess. Reckless. And he also has an unusual academic interest in women's legs. Hmm. He's writing his PhD thesis on the hosiery industry. His father was the manager of a hosiery factory, so he's very interested in stockings. As part of his studies, he's measuring the height of women's skirts from the ground. And over the course of the 1920s, he's noticed hemlines have been on the rise. Would you look at from that? From below the ankle, then to the calf, and finally above the knee. By 1927, they will be a full 15 inches off the ground. Amazing. And being an economist, George puts two and two together. He notices that the rise in hemlines matches the rise of the Dow Jones Index. That's not a coincidence. He calls his theory the hemline index. Super genius. The hemline index is an economic index that ties the rise of the economy to the rise of the hemline. So as the economy goes from slower to faster, the hemline rises accordingly up the leg of the skirt-wearing lady. In August 1921, the Dow Jones Industrial Index stands at a low of 63 points. By September 1929, it rises to a high of 381 points. That's a whopping 600% increase. Good gravy! In the same period, the number of advertisements for hosiery in Vogue magazine nearly doubles. I love you. And the amount of flesh on display increases by a staggering 800%. Fabulous! Apart from the hemline, women were also wearing less clothes. So in 1913, you were wearing nearly 20 yards of fabric. By 1925, you're wearing about seven yards of fabric. And these lighter, freer clothes are a reflection of the new lifestyle they're leading. It made it much easier for them to partake in all of these leisure activities that were new and trendy in the 1920s. 
They could go bicycle riding. They could go golfing. They could do these things that would have been difficult to do with the old fashions. And they could dance. While women are liberating their hemlines and dancing the Charleston, a Hollywood director is filming his daughter, Mildred Unger, 2,000 feet in the air. There she is, dancing the Charleston on the wings of the plane without, as far as you can see, any kind of safety mechanism at all. It's absolutely extraordinary to watch. What's going on? <laughs> oh, she's on top of the plane. Is she on top of the plane? Where is children's services is my number one question. Oh, wow. I want to do this so badly. Whose mother let her go on a plane? That's what I want to know. And how did this conversation go? Like, hey, listen, uh, is that your kid? Oh, come here, we have a great idea. <laughs> wow. It shows kind of the craziness of the period. She's 10 years old, and she's 2,000 feet in the air, and she's dancing on the wing of an airplane. Oh, you don't see that every day. What it speaks to in the 1920s is this real appetite for spectacle. So what was it about the 20s that made them roar? And could what happened then happen again? It turns out that the 1920s and the 2020s are linked by two doctors, separated by 101 years and 7,218 miles. It's December 31st, 2019. In the city of Wuhan, China, a young medical doctor named Li Wenliang notices a worrying rise in the incidence of a SARS-like illness. He sends a message to his colleagues. Those first seven cases are an alarm bell for what will become the worldwide coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> 101 years earlier, on the other side of the world, another doctor has also noticed something out of the ordinary. It's January, 1918. Dr. Loring Minor is a large, gruff man with a handlebar mustache and an affinity for alcohol. His practice extends over hundreds of square miles across the Kansas prairie. Sorry about that. On his rounds, he notices a worrying rise in the number of people suffering from flu-like symptoms. Their skin turns blue and purple from the lack of oxygen, and they have a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Young men are dying, and this is right next to one of the main army bases where young Americans are being trained up, ready to be sent to Europe to help in the fight against the Germans. At the nearby Camp Funston, a soldier reports to the medics with similar symptoms. A week later, there are another 100 cases, and by the end of the month, 500. It's the first outbreak of what history will come to know as the Spanish flu pandemic. This is a time, almost for the first time in American history, where young Americans are being sent abroad in large numbers, and the fact is that they're carrying a deadly virus. During World War I, 10 million soldiers are killed. No one knows exactly how many die from the flu pandemic, but estimates suggest that one-third of the world's population is infected, and up to 100 million people lose their lives. World War I affected the entire nation, and so did the Spanish flu. It didn't spare families, and it, it spread quickly, and it was frightening. People wore masks. Uh, movie theaters and restaurants shut down, and there was a lot of separating of people, and there was a real shutdown of the culture. In North America, there are three waves of the pandemic between spring 1918 and the summer of 1919, when it finally fizzles out. a global catastrophe on this scale end in a decade-long party? History shows us uh, that following times of sacrifice, we like to indulge. We just got out of World War I, going over the hump of the Spanish flu. So that's setting the stage for some wild, wild party. And who better to kick off the party than the regiment that sacrificed 1,400 lives, more than any other U.S. regiment on the Western Front? The 369th Infantry Regiment is an African-American unit recruited largely from Harlem. 
When they set out for the war in 1917, their refused permission to join in the farewell parade of New York's National Guard, known as the Rainbow Division. In the words of the National Guard's commander, black is not a color in the rainbow. The notion was that African-American men were cowardly, that they could not fight. They would be afraid to fight white people, basically. And then wherever they went, they encountered racism from American troops. To deal with it, the United States said, you know, let's just send them overseas. So they were like some of the first troops to go overseas. And then the US Army didn't know what to do with them. So they put them with the French. When they reach the Western Front, they will spend 191 days on the line and are awarded 171 Croix de Guerre, the French Medal for Heroism. The unit becomes the most decorated of all serving American regiments. So great is their reputation in combat, the Germans give them their nickname, the Hell Fighters. They were fierce fighters. They were injured, they were stabbed, they were bayoneted, but they fought and fought against this whole regiment until they made them retreat. When they return, they are given pride of place in the New York City Victory Parade. An estimated five million people line Manhattan's Fifth Avenue from 23rd Street to 143rd. 3,000 surviving Hellfighters march as heroes in close formation with regimental band leader James Reese Europe, who's the first black American officer to have led troops into combat. Now, James Reese Europe was the foremost musician of that period. And after seven miles, they reach Harlem at last. And James commands the regimental band to stop playing marching music. Instead, they burst into jazz. Jazz music encompasses the, the Roaring Twenties more than any other music genre. It is the soundtrack. It sets the mood for the whole decade, and it spreads all around the world. Jazz music is the tightest It can be so spiritual, and it can be like so elemental. It can be ridiculous at times. I love me a good trumpet. It's like whiskey, smooth whiskey. When you listen to jazz, it's like a mysterious man comes up to you with a bouquet of flowers, and then your mom magically appears and tells you she's proud of you, and then your boss says that you're his boss now and you can wear a power suit. That's what jazz feels like. It's just a wild ride from start to finish. The thing that makes jazz so amazing, first of all, it's the freedom, the improvisational nature of it. It's also something people had not heard before. It was a new music. It was a new way of thinking about what music could do. It's music for an urban jungle. It's got that kind of clanging dissonance, in a sense, that, that feels very modern. It's not easy, it's not harmonic, it's not soothing. It's jangling and jarring and exciting and sexy. The birth of jazz coincides with the first Great Migration, where waves of African Americans left the South and headed to the urban centers of the North. A million African Americans came North from 1914 to 1919. And that changed the whole dynamic of what cities would be, like Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, New York, where large populations grow. There were a lot of challenges that came with this, the tremendous overcrowding and underemployment and poverty. But an upside that happened is this flowering of the arts. And jazz music was really influential. It's very much an African-American art form, but it's something that is totally embraced by the young, white, urban population. People thought that they were edgy and attractive and interesting. And so jazz music drove social integration in a way that hadn't been seen before. But it also seeded a lot of anxiety. A secret organization, the Ku Klux Klan, spread its poisonous influence throughout a large part of the country. The 20s were a time when people came together, but the 20s were a time when the Ku Klux Klan was rising up and becoming really influential, especially in the first part of the decade. By 1924, it had spread to maybe two million members, and people were, were overtly part of the Klan, and that was a real demonstrable example of a group trying to go backwards in time. There were even a lot of efforts to suppress freedoms. 
And there was this real trend in the 1920s where people seemed to think that they could legislate their way to a moral, just, peaceful, innocent world. January 1920. New legislation is passed, and the 18th Amendment is enshrined in the Constitution, banning the manufacture and sale of intoxicating liquor. Prohibition is a movement that happens in the United States and it's actually started much earlier. Remember, our roots in this country are puritanical. A lot of the early settlers really think that drink is wicked. Drink is the devil's brew. Boss, to pass a certain public house, a tavern of unsavory repute. I mortgaged my home and my family too. It was really born out of a sense that Drinking was the source of all kinds of social evils. So if the drink were eradicated, then there would be less trouble, there'd be less violence, and it was really seen as sort of a moral imperative. Prohibition, America's unique attempt to legislate morality in an age that wasn't really interested in it. It's the beginning of prohibition, and America officially goes dry, but unofficially. When prohibition is passed, they hope it's going to improve society, improve behavior, make people harder working and more virtuous. The problem is no one wants to practice it. Everybody still wants to drink. People didn't stop drinking. They just started supporting illegal, illicit activities that would get them drink. The 1920s is the age of the speakeasy, where alcohol is plentiful for those who know the password, and there are plenty who do. Come right on in and name your poison. All you really needed to open your own speakeasy was a couple of bottles of liquor in a room to have it in, and that's exactly what it was like. One of the statistics about the 20s is that for every bar that closes, three speakeasies open. So that tells you something about the number of people that are going, the success of these kind of places. By the end of the 1920s, New York boasts 32,000 speakeasies. That's one illegal bar for every 390 people, or three times as many as legal bars today. And that's only the ones we know about. The number that go under the radar is probably double that again, upwards of 100,000. You don't see that every day. Another revealing statistic is how many policemen were able to amass large savings even when their salaries were quite modest. What's the password, stinky feet? In Boston, there are four operational speakeasies on the same street as the Boston Police Department. I don't know, Captain. Everybody seems drunk in this neighborhood. And in 1927, the prosecution of a San Francisco hotel clerk accused of selling liquor has to be abandoned. <laughs> Maybe he can be innocent and guilty. When nine members of the jury are caught drinking the evidence. Honestly, if alcohol was banned, uh, if I learned anything in the pandemic that I can't go a week without it, um, I would just make it myself. Yeah. Maybe i just make my own moonshine, just in my basement or something, like, like how people are doing sourdough bread during the pandemic, just start making my own booze. I'll ferment everything. I'll just ferment alcohol in my bathtub and just bathe in it. The boys in prison have figured it out. They're making their own hooch in these toilet bowls out here. I'm sure I am just as creative as your average inmate. So <laughs> I can definitely work something out. If alcohol was banned, I would still find a way to get it as long as it was safe. Just want to make sure I don't get, like, moonshine that blinds me. Between 1920 and 1929, up to 9 million gallons of pure alcohol were consumed. That's the equivalent of two and a quarter billion standard size beers. But booze is only part of the story. The speakeasy is where Americans come to drink, listen to music, and to dance. But to dance, you also need a partner. And what the number 18 did for jazz and black musicians, the number 19 will do for women. August 1920, the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution is ratified. The ladies appeared at the polls on election day by the hundreds of thousands. They had won their right to vote. It's the culmination of a decades-long struggle, finally granting women the right to vote. For so many years, American men did not want women to vote. For instance, Woodrow Wilson was against women voting in 1913. 
But by 1918, after having gone through World War I, he had a whole different attitude. He said, you know, women have sacrificed. They've created a whole mobilization to help the war effort. During the war, women go to work while men are away. The fact that they get the vote very quickly after the war is a reflection, I think, of the contribution they've made to society in that time. But that suffrage was not experienced the same way. While white women had much more opportunities to vote, African-American women did not. Women of other minorities did not. Many women had to wait for decades more to be given their right to vote. But for the first time, women become equal participants in American society, equal citizens. The 19th Amendment gives the vote to 26 million women. In the next decade, the number of women in the workplace will rise from 8.3 to 11 million. Corset sales will decline by two thirds. And the number of women buying cigarettes will more than double. For the first time, they can go out into the world. And in the 1920s, you see so many amazing female role models, from movie stars to anthropologists to writers to doctors. This is a time when women really understand and properly begin to live the idea that they don't just have to be wives and mothers. For one young woman, it proves to be a particularly dramatic shift, which in her case is marked by the number one. Her best friend calls her pie face because she likes apple pie. She's an unfashionable wannabe dancer and actress. I got an idea. She escapes the Midwest and comes to the Big Apple in pursuit of a dream and expensive clothes. She ends up dancing in the Ziegfeld Follies, which is scantily clad ladies doing high kicks on stage. It was a pretty established route to go into uh, the movies from. You're fired! Oh, boogers. When she's fired from the stage, her best friend decides she's in need of a makeover. She's very down in the dumps. She loses a job. She doesn't get a job she hoped for, and her friend takes her off to have a haircut. Come on in. But instead of a woman's hairdresser, their destination is a barber's shop. A little bit here, a little bit the there. The barber shortens her bangs in a line above her eyebrows. Terrific. He shapes the sides into points at her cheekbones, and at the nape of her neck, he uses a number one razor. Voila! It's the world's first shingle bob. That's great. Her name is Louise Brooks. And it's not long after she steps off the barber's swivel chair that she will see her name in lights in Hollywood. Thank you very much. The independence of the 1920s is kind of encapsulated by this one haircut that Louise Brooks has, and she becomes the archetypal flapper. She also becomes one of the biggest Hollywood stars of the silent movie era, inspiring a whole generation of young female imitators. At one point, it's said that in New York alone, 2,000 women a day are getting the shingle. All over America in the 20s, girls are getting their hair shingled or shorn. They have them with a Marcel wave. Ironically, of course, they're quite hard to maintain. You have to go to the hairdresser more often. And it's part of the explosion in the cosmetics and beauty industry that happens in the 1920s as well. Women are suddenly the object of the marketing men. <laughs> In 1920, there are only 5,000 hairdressing salons in the United States. Just four years later, there are 21,000. At the start of the decade, makeup was for women of doubtful reputation, and there was no such thing as getting a facial at a beauty salon. But by the end of the decade, there are 18,000 salons nationwide offering 1,300 brands and shades of face powder, 350 rouges, Terrific. and 100 red lipsticks. Fabulous. Female beauty has become a $52 million industry. <laughs> Free at last, she not only dressed freely, but was lavish with makeup, chewed gum, and even smoked in public. And the one place these coiffed and confident young women can go to is the speakeasy. Yes, I know. Knock three times and tell them you're a friend of Charlie's. Speakeasies are a place where, almost for the first time, women are able to go and have a drink. I think the fact that you get music and dancing quite often in a speakeasy makes it a place that's very attractive to women. And part of what happened in speakeasies was dating. Dating was new in the United States. They can now go out without a chaperone. They can go on dates with fellas. <laughs> they can nick, they can flirt, and it doesn't destroy their reputations because in some ways the best way to say it is everybody's doing it. 
Only 14% of women born before 1900 said they had premarital sex before the age of 25. By the 1920s, that number has more than doubled to 34%. In the course of the decade, the birth rate actually drops by 20%, which may be explained by the fact that during the same period, condom sales double. But how many times do you have to kiss a boy to change the course of history? For Lottie G, that number proves to be 501. It's 1921. A new show opens on Broadway called Shuffle Along. It's the first Broadway musical with a book, music, dance, and cast created wholly by African Americans, including Noble Sissel, a veteran of the Harlem Hellfighters who, with UB Blake, wrote the music. Shuffle Along was the music sensation of 1921, and it never should have made it to Broadway, but it changed Broadway. It's essentially your old-fashioned boy-meets-girl musical romance, only in this case, it's portraying black romance on par with white, which is a gamble. Before this period, the notion of a black love scene on stage is considered anathema to white audiences. They cannot stand the idea of black people loving each other. So Cicel and Blake, of course, write a number of love scenes into this because it's about black life and black culture, black joy, we love each other. But they're terrified that the audience is going to stampede out. Ladies and gentlemen. It's May 23rd, 1921. Opening night at the Daily's 63rd Street Theater. On stage in the limelight, the young lovers Lottie G and Roger Matthews are about to sing their duet, Love Will Find a Way. Backstage, the composer, Noble Sissel, can hardly bear to watch. He stands by the stage door, one foot inside the theater, the other on the street pointing north toward Harlem, afraid that if the song bombs, they'll be run out of town. The song is received in silence. Until suddenly, Sissel hears wild applause break out and an encore is called for. Shuffle Along will run for another 501 performances, becoming one of the longest running musical shows of the decade. Shuffle Along is a phenomenon. It creates a desire to see African-American music and culture, and uh, it leads people to go up to Harlem, who've never been before. Harlem at night has been a symbol the world over for jazz and cabaret life. It's at a time when, as Langston Hughes famously puts it, the Negro was in vogue. And suddenly, what they are creating is seen as valuable and important, and part of American life. It's seen as integral to it for the first time. Harlem becomes the cultural mecca of Manhattan. That's how it is. That's how it and the underground subculture comes out of the closet, dressed in sequin gowns and white tuxedos. One of the things that Harlem is known for in the 20s is not just the great music and the sort of great nightlife, it's also a place where gender and sexual roles can be transgressed and played with a little bit. The Stonewall Riot in 1969 is often considered the beginning of the gay rights movement. But more than 50 years earlier, Harlem's famous drag balls are part of a flourishing, highly visible LGBTQ nightlife. It's February 26, 1926, the biggest night of Harry Walter's life. Outside, two feet of snow blankets the ground. Ladies and But inside, gentlemen. the heat is on at the Renaissance Ballroom and Casino in Harlem for the 58th annual Hamilton Lodge Ball. 1,000 of New York's finest, dressed in tuxedos and gorgeous ball gowns, crowd the dance floor. And as midnight strikes, it's time for the grand parade in front of the judges. And the best costume is... First prize goes to... Harry, as the best-dressed drag queen of them all. Thank you very much. What's really interesting about these drag balls, these fairy balls, is that they weren't just for an underground subculture. They were for everyone. They're reported about in the popular media, in the popular press. A lot of the attendees are straight, and they're just going to be part of this world. There's nothing strange in it. 
Drag shows, drag balls, parties that happen in queer spaces and queer parties are like just the best parties. Glitz and glam, it's always a party. Lots of sequins. Lots of bright lights, a lot of Whitney Houston covers. There's just so much flair and color and people are voguing. The swag of it all, like the level of confidence that it takes to do that, I don't have it. I don't do well with eyeshadow. I'm envious of drag queens and, and balls. I want to look as good as they do, like In the 1920s, the LGBTQ community was much more open than many of us might realize. People describe going to Harlem and going into a, a bar or a speakeasy and seeing a table where you've got two black boys, two white boys, and they're all dressed as women, and up on the dance floor are two girls dressed in tuxedos dancing together. Identity's fluid, gender's fluid, and it feels quite modern. That isn't to say that there was widespread acceptance everywhere. Although they were allowed to exist, they were also really complicated and problematic for mainstream culture as well. Jean Mallon is six feet tall and 200 pounds, and one of New York's most famous female impersonators, who wins prizes for wearing costumes made up entirely of pink and gold feathers. One night, he wanders into a Greenwich cafe in full drag wig and makeup. <laughs> Four rough birds begin to heckle him, and as he shimmies by their table, they throw a pitcher of water on him. What's the matter with you? Jean barely bats a false eyelash before fighting back. Three of them he beats to a pulp. The fight spills out onto the street, and the fourth heckler is only saved from Malin by two passing taxi drivers. Afterwards, Malin had tears in his eyes. When asked why, he pointed out that during the fight, he had ripped his gown. <laughs> Jean Mallon is exactly 12 pounds heavier than boxing champion Jack Dempsey. But unlike Mallon's punch, Dempsey's right hook will be heard right across America. After a great deal of pre-fight ballyhoo, the two men met at historic Boyle's 30 acres in New Jersey. It's called the fight of the century. Dempsey versus Georges Carpentier for the world heavyweight title. 80,000 people filled every inch of Boyle's 30 acres. But these spectators are only a fraction of what will be the largest audience so far in history, because this is the first sporting event ever broadcast to a mass audience on the radio. It's a confident Dempsey in his prime, who started at Capontier, a truly great fighter. Round four of the Manassa Mola floors the Frenchman, who's virtually helpless in the hands of Dempsey. But Capontier rises again with a fighting heart. It's weapon. estimated that commentary of Dempsey's fourth round knockout punch is heard by more than 300,000 people in 61 cities across Atlantic America. Radio, originally a feeble means of communication, grew from this small shack, the first commercial station in America, to gigantic proportion. One of the great technological and cultural developments of the 1920s is the radio. People use it for listening to news, they listen to music, they listen most of all to sporting events. Radio transformed sport because it allowed people to, to experience games in real time as they were happening, so you didn't have to read about them in the paper the next day. Baseball, boxing, and horse racing. You sat by your radio, you could hear the Yankees play even if you didn't go to the game in person. The great sportsmen of the 1920s become household names because radio brings them into everybody's household. Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was the biggest celebrity, the most famous person in America, more so than the president. Break it now with only two games left. He did interviews and he was in the movies and so he had this multi-dimensional presence in media and it was just really exciting and we couldn't have had celebrities like this before without all the technologies that brought them into our homes. In 1921, the year the first sporting event was broadcast, there are only five radio stations across the U.S. By the end of the decade, there are 606. Annual radio sales increased from 60 million to 843 million dollars. And by the end of the decade, 20 million households have a radio receiver. That's nearly 40% of all American families. 
This is the era of innovation, and it's not just radio that's transforming lives. The 1920s sees extraordinary technological advances which benefit people's lives. In the house, we have all sorts of domestic appliances which we never had before, the vacuum cleaner, the dishwasher, the toaster. But also, you have the transformation from a coal-based economy and a steam-based economy into a petrol and oil-based economy, and this means cars. The 20th century is racing into a new era, the era of the Tin Lizzie, the Model T. Henry Ford had 10,000 dealerships in this country, and there were 13 million cars on the road. Incredible mobility happening. It is Henry Ford's own invention that is placing a nation behind the wheels of adventure. A few generations ago, you might have never really left the county where you were born. And with an automobile, your range increased tremendously. Now the whole family could get away from the noise and the heat of the city. The idea that you could buy a car which would then let you drive around the entire country independently becomes something to aspire towards. And that really transforms American society because it brings with it a network of roads, motels, and petrol stations. And people can get into cities to work. It transforms every single aspect of American society. Technology will not only transform day-to-day -day life, it will make the most unlikely of dreams come true. When Bessie Coleman is six years old in 1898, no one has yet flown in an airplane. The 10th child of a Cherokee father and African-American mother from Waxahachie, Texas, she walks four miles each day to and from her one-room segregated school, and works in the cotton fields at harvest time. After the Great War, she can only afford one semester at college, but then she hears the stories of Air Force pilots returning from France, and her dream is born. As a young girl, she decides she wants to learn to fly. But she can't get flying lessons in the United States to get qualified as a pilot because she's a person of color. So she decides to learn French at night school and then travels to Paris to learn to fly, Bonjour. where she earns her pilot's license in 1921, two years before Amelia Earhart. When she returns to the States, she becomes a barnstorming stunt flyer. She wows crowds across America and becomes an instant media sensation. And her favorite stunts? The loop-de-loop -loop and the highly dangerous figure eight. I'm flying! Bessie Coleman is the first American woman of African American and Native American descent both to have a pilot's license and to actually fly and perform as a stunt pilot in America. It's absolutely extraordinary. There was a notion in the 20s that Bessie caught on to that she could become who she wanted to be. She had this sense of incredible freedom of possibility, whether you're a woman or man, black or white, and Bessie Coleman is the epitome of, I'm gonna fly into my dream. Bessie Coleman is the pioneer of what will become a brand new industry, commercial air travel. The first international passenger flights from Key West, Florida to Havana, Cuba, take off in 1920. In 1926, the total number of airline passengers in the United States is less than 6,000. But by the end of the decade, that number leaps to 173,000. Air travel makes anything possible. Think about it this way. In 1903, the Wright brothers made their first flight. In 1969, we land on the moon. Within literally 66 years, we went from flying to flying to space. Traveling in air in the 1920s gave us that feeling that nothing's impossible. You know, the sky's the limit. That's why we say that. The 1920s is the decade where the sky does seem limitless, as the number of shares traded on the New York Stock Exchange grows from 200 million to over a billion. 
American society in the 20s is propelled by this huge sense of optimism. Business is going to be the answer to all our problems. Salesmen are the kind of angels of American society. And people are making so much money on things like stocks and shares. Lots of money. That's what they all the stock market is soaring like never before. And people don't really understand, but the stock market is like a horse race. It's a gamble. And so at a certain point, your horse is not going to win. They can't believe that something that's been going so well for a decade could tumble off a cliff just like that. One man who does believe it is an investor on Wall Street. After making a bundle in the bull market, the story goes that he decides to get his Oxford brogues polished up. Tobacco's doing good. But when the shoe shine boy begins to give him stock tips, hmm. It's not so much a light bulb moment, it's an alarm bell. He realizes that if a shoe shiner has an opinion on stocks, they are becoming dangerously popular, and it's time to get out. He does exactly that, returns to his office, unloads his stocks, and withdraws from the market. His name is Joe Kennedy, father of the future president JFK. He's one of the few lucky ones to save his fortune. The New York Stock Exchange was in a turmoil. Frantic investors had scrambled to unload their securities at any price. On October 24th, 1929, newspaper headlines announced the end of the Roaring Twenties. The line can't always go up on the graph. And when it came down, it came down fast and it came down hard. The great bubble had burst of the 1920s. It goes down in history as Black Thursday, when the Dow Jones Index falls by 11%. On Black Monday, it loses another 12.82%. On Black Tuesday, yet another 11.73% disappears, which represents $14 billion in losses, the equivalent of $213 billion today. And the slide will continue until July 8th, 1932, when the index bottoms out after losing a whopping 89.2% of its value. A feeling of apprehension, even fear, replaces the unchecked optimism Americans once felt. That's the end of the 20s. We have the, the Great Crash leading to the Great Depression. Millions and millions of people were out of work. They didn't understand why. Common terms, food, clothing, shelter, take on a new importance. There were shacks where people had to live and they had to have food lines and soup lines and soup kitchens to feed people because they were going hungry. By 1933, nearly half of America's banks have failed and unemployment approaches 15 million people or 30% of the workforce. And just as the hemline provided an index of growth in better times, the rise of the shoe shine is an index of the Great Depression. Before the crash, the New York Times reported there were only a handful of shoe shines on the streets of New York. By 1932, the New York Police Department reports there are now more than 7,000 desperately trying to earn a living on the streets. In a single block on West 43rd Street, the newspaper now counts 19 shoe shines plying their trade. Nice job, here you go. In better times, the going rate was a dime with a nickel tip. And now they're happy if they get a single nickel. Sorry, that's all I got. And before, the shoeshine boy used to be under the age of 17. Now it's common to see men over 70. the effects of the Great Depression. The culture changed, entertainment industries changed, fashions changed, music changed. And it didn't all happen overnight. 
but you can see the beginnings of the end. At the start of the 1930s, prohibition is repealed, bars and nightclubs are once more regulated, the LGBTQ community is pushed underground, Hollywood is censured, and women's skirt lengths plunge downward. The Roaring Twenties have come to an inauspicious end. So, as we move into the 2020s, will we see history repeat itself? Will this be the decade of the Roaring Twenties 2.0? Will the 2020s be like the 1920s? Absolutely. The idea of unbridled prosperity, pandemics, racial strife, all these elements are back in play. And so it makes you feel like there's a cycle. History shows us that following war, we always want peace. Following sacrifice and solitude, we always want celebration and indulgence. Maybe we'll get our own version of the 1920s 100 years later. The young taking center stage, the sense of freedom and excitement, a sense of modernity. I think we can expect all those things in the decade to come. People are going to party like it's 1920, literally. Just now we're going to see it on social media. Uh, hopefully we're heading towards a roaring 20s. I have my flapper dresses ready, like I really do. <laughs> Smog all the time and floods and typhoons and wealth inequality is going to worsen. But that's going to make people want to party more when we can, so those are going to be nuts. Billionaires are trying to leave the Earth right now. <laughs> when the richest people on the planet are trying to get off of it, it's probably not a good sign. If we're not heading into another roaring 20s, I, sh I will shave my head. <laughs> <laughs>